Hi, thank you very, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming on to this talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how you can use Symphony components to refactor <coughs> your existing application, particularly if it's a, a, some legacy code or something that you'd just like to to modernise and improve. Uh, a little bit about me: uh, I'm the head developer for a company called Ground Six. We're a technology investment firm based in the northeast of England. So people come to us with tech-based business ideas. We build them into a product and we build them into a business. Uh, I'm also a technical author. I've written a couple of books about different content management systems and PHP uh, applications. And occasionally I get to speak at events and conferences such as this. So the components. Uh, the Symphony framework is built using a series of standalone reusable components. Um, they've been released independently so that you don't need to use them as part of the framework. You can use them in your own application, be it legacy, be it something brand new. And it ranges from things such as browser emulation, CSS selecting, finding files, routing within your application, security, translations, forms, a whole host of things that are available out there. Uh, you can find all the information about them on the, uh, the Symfony component website. It's got all the documentation for each of them as well as download and installation instructions. So why might you want to use components as opposed to just using the Symfony framework or rebuilding it in something else or refactoring using some other traditional methods? Well, the first one is that the components, they solve common problems that already exist. Why reinvent the wheel? Why build a translation tool when there's already one out there? Why build a router when there's already one out there? There's things that exist that do this really well. And you can focus on building the product using the business logic that it needs, and not worry about the actual fundamentals of how the application and the underlying aspects work. They're very well documented. All the source code is available. It's very easy to raise issues, get them fixed. The installation, usage, and extending instructions are excellent. So if you decide that you want to change how it works for your particular use case, it's very easy to do that as well. They're often built in a way that allows you to interchange different aspects of them. So for example, with the routing component, you can use a YAML file to pull in your routes. You can use annotations. You can use other types of file. You can use PHP code, or you could write your own extension if you want to. They're very well interchangeable. Uh, they're relatively standalone. I say relatively because some of them do have some dependencies on the other. So if you want to use the routing component with YAML, you need the YAML component as well. Uh, but apart from that, they are relatively standalone and work well independently. And I think they're ideal for refactoring. As I say, they allow you to focus on building your application, building the product, getting business in, rather than thinking, oh, I've got to build all these things that I need to have a solid, stable platform. So if you've got something that's legacy, needs to be refactored or put onto something that's more stable, instead of going, right, let's scrap this and go and use WordPress or Magento or the Symfony framework, let's do a bit at a time. Let's introduce a router. Let's introduce this. Let's introduce that, which is a very nice aspect. So if you want to install any of the components, uh, the knight in shining armor for this is Composer. For anybody that's not using Composer, I really suggest that you do. Download it it's by running that command in the command line. That will download the Composer dependency management system. Create a composer.json file in your project. This is just a, a JSON file that says what dependencies your project has. So for example, it would be symphony forward slash and then the project name of the components that you want to use. So it could be routing, translation, you just say that you want the current development version. That'll allow you to pull that in. Then you run Composer, and you've got all the components that you've asked for. So if you want the routing component, just add it to you, your um, composer.json file. If you want other components, you add them as well. It's very straightforward. <coughs> I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of their friends. So there's uh, SwiftMailer, Twig, Pimple. They're made by a lot of the team behind uh, the Symfony components and the Symfony framework, but they're not, not part of the component suite. And there's also a, a third-party caching library that I'm going to talk about when we talk about templates and Twig. So a little bit about what's in store today. I'm going to talk about how you can auto-load your classes using the Symfony component class loader, so you don't have to worry about how to pull in your PSR0 compatible code. How you route requests using the Symfony router. How you can listen for events within your application, so a new user has been created, a new bit of content has been posted how you can use the event dispatcher to listen for those events and react and do something. We're going to parse YAML files so that we can easily use configuration within our, our code, and also how we can deal with HTTP requests using the HTTP Foundation component. We'll also look at injecting dependencies, so instead of having dependencies scattered in some legacy code base, we can make use of something like Pimple to inject them. And finally, we'll look at some templating with Twig as well, so that we can turn a legacy templating solution into something nice and user-friendly, developer-friendly at least. 
Around uh, eight months ago or so, uh, a project landed on my desk that was an existing web application with a reasonable amount of user-generated content, reasonable amount of members, reasonable amount of traffic. You know, nothing fantastic, but still very good numbers. And we had a problem. It was very slow to develop on this. There was an existing team in place, and they were trying to add new features. And because of how old the code base was, it was just passed from developer to developer to developer. Nothing was consistent. There was lots of very old techniques. You could see when a new uh, design pattern or technique could become popular, or became the previous developer's flavor of the month. They saw it, went wild with it, and then it got forgotten about. So there was no consistency, no standards, and everything seemed to be about how the code worked together, and nothing was about how the code was doing what the business needed. So we had, a, we had two choices, really. We could either scrap what we had and rebuild it using something like WordPress, Symfony Framework, Joomla, another content management system, or Drupal, or something like that. The risks that we thought associated with that were we've obviously got all that business logic in our code that we couldn't guarantee we'd remember it all. We might not get all of it. Um, and no idea how it would be possible to, to guarantee that every last bit of that would be kept. It's so easy to sort of say, right, well, we'll use this module to deal with authentication, and it misses that crucial edge case or that, that use case that you need. So we thought there was quite a lot of risk associated with that. As well, you've also got all your existing content, your users, your members, and you've got to do some form of database migration. That becomes particularly hard when you're using something off the shelf because you don't know exactly what your resulting database is going to look like until you've decided on all the modules you've got to use and built any custom modules. So we went down the option of, let's refactor what's there. The business logic that we've got in the application is good, it's just hidden away. We need to get rid of the application uh, specific stuff, get everything there that focuses on what the product does. And that's what we decided to do. So we had a very messy structure. There was some objects, there was some procedural code, monolithic code that was just included and ran blindly. Uh, it wasn't very nice, so we needed to look at standardizing that using something like the PSRO standard. So we're gonna make use of the class loader for that. Globals, singletons, crazy godlike objects all over the place. So we needed to manage that. That's where pimple comes in. Routing logic was all over the place. Come into an index file, lots of if else conditions, delegate to another file with if else conditions several files down the chain, you've got your actual code that does what you want. So we needed the router to fix that. We had a lot of duplicated logic all over the place. So if a user created an account, they'd get an email. If a user created some content, they'd get an email. But that email code was just a function call somewhere else. So if we wanted to add it to something, you'd have to go find the new bit where you want to send an email and put that function call in. If you needed to remove it, you had to go and find the bits of code, remove it. Not very extendable, but not terrible at the same time. The event dispatcher lets us listen for those events and act on them <coughs> separately. We also had a lot of PHP and HTML mixed together. You'd look at a template file and it was just horrendous. The uh, designer on the project, it was very difficult for him to actually do any design work that wasn't just CSS or images because the HTML files were so interlaced with PHP and business logic. It just didn't make any sense. Uh, we also had a lot of uh, spaghetti form logic, so when a form was submitted, validation was very messy, very sporadic, and very duplicated. So we looked at some validation libraries. There were some of the improvements we introduced, such as uh, the mailer component, Swift mailer, uh, translation, and validation. So how do we solve messy and procedural code using the likes of a class loader? Well, to refactor the code to a more uh, suitable standard, such as PSRO, we needed to have a solid foundation in place that we could then make use of that component with. So we had to lay the foundations. First stage was our controllers. The only controllers we had which were objects were ones that dealt with form submissions. Everything else was just a PHP file that was included and ran blindly. It didn't make very much sense and it was very difficult for us to, to work with. So we changed everything so that it was object-based, made it much more, more suitable, and we restructured it using the PSRO standard. So we introduced namespaces, restructured it to a better directory hierarchy, using component-based approach for our own code as well as the components that we're going to build in. Now that we've got that, we then don't want extra code and files lying around that tie us up with how do we order load that code. We want something to take care of that. And that's where the class loader comes in. All that we need to do was define our own namespaces, so there they are in that array. Create a new universal class loader object, register that class loader, and then tell it to register all of our namespaces. And with those three lines of code, plus our array of namespaces, we've set up our new code base with PSRO auto-loading all taken care of. 
So now we can just make use of our class and it's automatically included, which was exactly what we needed. It has some built-in caching support available through APC. Uh, there's a, it's built into the, the code that's available. You just need to include the, the relevant loader and add it to the, to the code. So with all of the global singletons and crazy objects everywhere, we needed a way of being able to make that much more manageable. We needed to know what code depended on which other bits. We needed a more flexible way of introducing new dependencies. So if all of a sudden a particular controller needs access to the authentication object, we needed a way of being able to manage that. <coughs> what we currently had was something that wasn't easy to test, wasn't easy to maintain, and it wasn't easy to understand. It made very little sense. And that's where Pimple really comes into play. It's a dependency injection container, which lets us put all of our dependencies into it, and we pass that container around to the application. So when the application says, I need to access your database, all it's got to do is look at the container and say, can you give me the database? And it's up to that container to manage that dependency. <clears throat> of course, to support a dependency injection container, your code has to be aware of it and it needs to know that it exists. So the first stage was to take existing code, such as this example model, which had a constructor, and then queries the database directly. We changed that so that instead there was a container passed as the constructor. Now at this stage, we've just got a container in there which doesn't have anything in, there's no database there yet, so we can't go ahead and uh, remove this dependency of a database that's currently hard-coded. But we've at least made the first step. We've went and said, right, this model should expect a container, and soon we can change it so that it gets the database and other dependencies from that container. One of the really cool things about Pimple is that it supports lazy loading by default. The way that you use it, everything will be loaded lazily. So if you want to create a database connection, 90% of your pages might not even need to hit the database, but if you've got a, a new database object somewhere, how do you then just say, if it's this page, I don't want that connection to be created. If it's this page, I do. Well, with Pimple, you simply put the new object instantiation into a closure. Then the first time you ask for that object, so the first time a bit of code tries to access this property from the container, it'll run the code and create the database object. So only when you first ask for it does something get run, which is really nice and performance friendly. Um, as you can see, it's accessed using the array access implementation. So although Pimple's an object, you can treat it just like it's an array, put properties in and get them in a similar way. Unfortunately though, by default, it'll return a new instance of that object every time we ask for that dependency, which isn't what we want. So you can share it. The container has a method called share, and if you put that closure in a function called to share, it'll say the first time you ask for the database, create it. Any other time you ask for it, just remember what was created previously and return it. So you're only having to create it the once during an execution cycle. You can see here the closure accepts an argument. This argument is managed by Pimple directly, so you just give it a name that you want it to be, and Pimple will pass a copy of itself into that variable so that you can use it within your code. So here we can get access to the user of the database, the password, and other information from the container. So if that changes, all we've got to do is change what we've already injected into our container. <coughs> so, some further refactoring. Now that we've got our container, which actually has a database in, we can then simply say, query, get the database from the container, and run the query. Which is much nicer, much easier to, to manage, and it's testable, because we can change what we're injecting into that. We can mock a database object and pass that quite nicely. We then got to the stage where we needed to be able to reuse that container for other projects as well, and we also had different use cases where if you were calling scripts via the command line, you didn't necessarily need um, the routing or the form components to be uh, made available to the, the dependency injection container. Similarly, when you're accessing it via the web, there's certain things that you do need and certain things that you don't need. So you can easily extend Pimple, simply implement the constructor, as a default parameter of values. Anything that you pass to that will automatically be populated in itself as properties with the values as the, the value of the array. And then in the constructor, you just put any loading that you want to do. So there you would say, create a new property that is database, and you'd put your PDO closure within there. That way you've got a nice container that's got all of your standard sort of 
strapping in place. If you've got something then that you need to, uh, when you need to access the command line, you could have a command line container that has your command line specific dependencies, one for your web access and that kind of thing. So you can have a nice container with relevant dependencies in. Another thing that we wanted to try and reduce was new method and in, new object instantiation within code all over the place. It meant if we wanted to change what that object was, we'd have to go into lots of files and change it. If we added new parameters to the constructor, we'd have to go into a lot of places and change that as well. So we wanted to try and reduce that. So we've got a controller here, which can access the container, and it's creating a model. That's the kind of thing that we wanted to try and reduce as another dependency. We were able to do that using the container as well by creating containers that stored uh, database access objects, containers that stored factories, and containers that stored other things. So in this example, I've got a database access object container, and I've put all my database access objects here. So if my user model wants to connect to the database, it will talk to the container, ask it for the data access object container, and then ask it for that particular object. Because we've got one for factories as well, the next time we want to get the user model, we can get a factory from the container and then get the user object from there. So here's an example. So I've got a model that I want to create. From the container, I get my factories container. And from that, I ask it for the model. And then I create a new model from there. So it allows us to reduce dependency on the new keyword as well and centralize where that's used. So when objects change and their, their constructed arguments change, we've got a couple of places where we can go and change that. It's much easier to manage. Of course, any parameters we pass there, we'd probably be passing to the constructor. But what this does mean is we could just create a new method in that factory that has a different, uh, different arrangement of parameters or arguments so that it works for older code as well as another method that works for newer code. We also found that we had a lot of um, hard-coded configuration about the place that we needed to try and centralize, and we wanted a way of easily managing that. Thankfully to Pimple, we can put all our settings in there, but we still needed a way that we could have a settings file that was easy to read, easy to alter, and easy to manage. Uh, there's ways such as just a, an any file. You could have an XML file. But one of the things that these simply components allow is YAML file parsing. YAML is a very nice, easy to read structure. You can look at it and you can see exactly what's in there. You don't have, it's not a PHP file with an array in, it's not a XML with lots of markup that you don't need. Anybody working on your project should be able to read that file and go, right, there's a group called database and their various properties. So we've got a host called localhost and there's another group of settings. It's very easy to read and very easy to, to maintain. If you want to parse one of those files, simply load the YAML parser and then tell it to pull in that file and parse it. And then you've got an array, an associative array containing all of that information, really easy to access. Put that in your container and you've got access to that wherever you need it. Unfortunately though, it doesn't support any sort of native caching. And one thing I have found is that YAML file parsing is quite intensive. So you probably want to have a look at implementing your own form of, of caching for that. The approach that we've opted for is we open up the file, create an MD5 signature of the file contents, and then look in memcache to see if we've already got a copy of it. If we do, then we build our array from that. If we don't, we parse the YAML file. So next, we've got all of our routing. So we've got files all over the place that deal with routing. Requests come into different files. Different files delegate to other files, which delegate again. We needed to centralize that which is where the Symfony routing component comes in. Thankfully, most of the work that we did in terms of making the code PSRO uh, compliant took care of a lot of the, the stuff that we needed to, the foundations we needed to lay to implement this, uh, this component. So one example is with our controllers. Constructors accept a container. The old actions would have a number of parameters. Our new actions simply had one parameter, which was an array of parameters that were available to the URL. This is just because of the way that the routing component works. You get an array that contains all of your, the bits of the URL. So if you're asking for an ID at the end of a URL, it will be put into an array that you can then pass in your, your control action. That's the only thing which I think is a downside to the component, is there's no easy way to map specific uh, URL parts to specific parameters without doing it manually, which you don't really want to do. 
So to get up and running with the component, the first thing you have to do is alias some of the namespaces, just so it's easier to, to reuse them later. So we've got the file locator, request context, and the routing aspects. File locator tells the component where it can get the, the file from. The request context tells it the URL and also whether you're posting, getting, deleting, or putting to that URL. And then the routing component itself with the router and routes and that kind of thing within it. We then have to prepare the dependencies. So we create a new file locator that says the routing file is somewhere in this folder and I'll tell you it later on. We create a request, which is basically the URL that the user is requesting. And from that, we create a request context it also contains a request method. So with that, we can then do our routing. So we construct a router, we pass it our file loader with a locator, a new file loader with our locator in. So it knows where the file will be, and it knows that it will be a YAML file. You can use your own different loaders as well. There's a few others built in. We're telling it that we've got a root start YML file that we want to use, so that's our YAML file. Any optional configurations, and then there's our application context. So sample roots file. A root will have a name, a pattern. So in this case, we're just looking at the home page of our application. Some defaults, which is a, an array of things that you can provide. Uh, they're typically used for two things. One is how we do the routing. So I want to say that anything that matches this pattern, I want to make use of this controller and call this method. Uh, the other case is if you've got a URL with user-definable aspects, which is an ID or a date. So if you're viewing a news article, it might be news slash a date slash some sort of slug. You could put some defaults in there that mean if a user omits one of those, fall back to one of those defaults. Any requirements that you've got on those parameters, so if there's a date, you can say the date format must be uh, year, month, day, and that it's got to be a get request. So that's how a roots file looks. It's written in YAML, this particular one, so it's quite easy to use and maintain. Then to actually do the, the routing itself. So we get the URL that the user is accessing. I found that it's a little bit unreliable with trailing slashes at the end, so just get rid of that. We match the URL, and if it's successful, that root will be an array containing the name of the root index and all these properties from our defaults. So it'll have three properties, uh, name, class, and method. And then what we want to say is create a new controller from that class name and call the method that was provided there. Now, if it can't find the root that you've uh, provided, it'll throw a resource not a found exception, so you can take it to a 404 page. If you try and post to a page where you've said you can only get, it's, um, I think it's a, a method not allowed exception. So it's quite helpful in terms of different exceptions for different edge cases. So if you want to deal with variables in your routing, so for example, you've got a, a news page, news with a category, then a date, and then an article, you can say that requirement is that that date variable must match that format. And this is a, a post form, so this is somebody adding a comment to an article. Then when it comes to our, our routing, what we want to do is we want to take the array which contains the name and this default, and we want to remove the name, class, and method from it so that we can pass an array that just contains category, date, and article. We're not passing any other routing rubbish to our controllers. You can also put authentication control in there. There is a security component available from Symfony as well, but that was a little bit overkill for what we needed. So what we, went, what we did was we went into our routes and we said, let's add a logged in property. So if a page requires a user to be authenticated, you don't have any hierarchy of different users. You're either logged in or you're not. We say this page requires a login. And then within the routing, we just check to see if that's been set. If it is, then the user needs to be logged in. If the user isn't logged in, so we're looking at our container for the user. If the user's not logged in, we've just set that to be no. Then we'll send them to a login page. You can also cache your roots file. Uh, simply add this extra option to your configuration. So you say, here's a cache directory, and there's the cache folder I want to use. Word of warning about this, if you start adding new pages or new routes to your application, make sure you're clearing the cache when you're in development mode or when you deploy new code to the server. The number of times we've been wondering why a page doesn't work, and it turns out that we've been caching the old one, it's, um, I've lost count now. One other drawback with the router is if you put some of the junk on your URL, such as any UTM tracking data, you know, UTM source, UTM campaign, that kind of thing, 
it's going to look for that in the roots file and if it can't find it it's going to say well I don't know what this page is I don't know why you're asking for a page with all this crap on the end of the URL so a little quick regular expression will take that out uh, as the source for where we got that from and then you can go back to your standard routing it's something where what we've taken the approach to do is if a root hasn't been found we then strip all get parameters from the URL and try another request just in case somebody's linking to it from an external site that depends any any get parameters on that aren't relevant to what we do so as I mentioned before the code was riddled with duplicated logic all over the place there was method calls deeply buried that would do things like sending emails and it wasn't nice if we wanted to add a, an email generation somewhere else you'd have to go deep into the code find where you wanted to add it and add that in if you needed to remove it again you had to find where it was remove it or add other other methods there it wasn't a pleasant task thankfully with the likes of the event dispatcher instead what you can do is your code does something such as a user is created you just fire an event and say a user has been created and push that onto a dispatcher that will then notify anybody that wants to know that a user has been created. So you can have a listener that says, I'm a, an email listener, I'm going to send emails out to various people. I want to listen to see if a user has been created. I want to listen to see if uh, content has been created. And I want to listen for all these other edge cases as well. So you can create those listeners and bind them to the various events. The main reason for why you'd want to do this is, you know, your code should do one thing and it should do one thing well. It shouldn't do a hundred things. So when a user is being created, that's what your code should do. It should be creating a user. It shouldn't be creating a user, then emailing, then doing something else, and then resizing an avatar, and then doing this, that, and the other. It should do one thing, create the user. So you can create that user via the event, and the listener can do the one thing that it does well, send the email, resize that avatar, that kind of thing. So some sample use cases that we use this for, uh, redirecting the user and displaying a flash notification. So if a user's logged out or they've um, requested a password reset email or they've tried to access a page that they're not allowed to, often we'll redirect and display a quick message on the screen. We made use of the event listener to, to do that. Sending transactional emails, as I mentioned before. Adding a product to a basket. So if you've got a content-based site like we had, we wanted our users to be able to pay to promote their content, we could listen for that content being created and say, is the user also trying to promote this content? Yes, they are. In that case, I'm going to also add it to their basket. Completely separate tasks, completely managed separately as well, which is very nice. And also hooking into other features. So you might want to tweet on content creation. If you wanted to do that with the old approach, you'd have to go find that content creation function and then add the code in there or add a method call, which isn't very nice. You want to be able to look in one place and say, right, I know a user's been created, and I know here are the things that will be triggered as a result of that. A quick example that I'll run through is how we do it for redirecting and flash notifications. So we want to raise an event when a user needs to be redirected. We want to listen for a notification events. So that's an event where we're saying, let's store a little message in the session to display on the next, next request. Log the notification in the session. Listen for a redirect event and redirect them. The ordering is important because we don't want to redirect them before we've set the session information, otherwise they'll never see the message. So we made an interface for notifiable message, a request redirection event. That's something that has to extend the Symphony Event Dispatcher default event. Uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned there. So a quick interface that said it's got a get notification a method and a get class method. Get class was used for any, um, if it was a success message or an error or a warning, we'd just use a class there that would be put into the template. And an event accepts a URL, has a get URL method. So we've got two separate things that can be combined quite nicely. And then finally, a listener. So a listener listens for something that needs to store a notification, sees the event's been raised, the event gets passed to it, sets some information in the session. Now that's just the listener, so it's not actually going to do any listening yet. We have to tell it to listen for those events. Another one for listening for a redirect user event, that just simply gets the URL and redirects them. Very straightforward. So in order to actually get it to listen, we have to create a dispatcher, create an instance of the listener, add the listener to the dispatcher and say, I want you to listen for a new user being created, new content being created or something. And the second parameter for that is a callable. So an object method combination, a closure, something like that. And optionally, a priority. Priority lets you sort of put the order in place. So I want to set the notification first, then redirect the user. 
And here's an example in action. So we create an event dispatcher, we create our listener, so here's the one that sets the notification, add the listener to the notify object, add it uh, an array containing the new object that we've created, the method call, and then the priority, and the same for redirecting. And then when we're ready to dispatch an event, so a user has done something that should trigger this, simply create a new event and dispatch it to our event dispatcher. The dispatcher is something that we then put into Pimple so that all aspects of our application were aware of it. A particular gotcha to watch out for, because we're extending the Symphony event, if you've got a, a name property, it's going to be overridden with the event name. So what we originally did was we set all of our models to extend this event so that we could easily just fire them into the event dispatcher. If you've then got something that takes that model and saves it, we're finding like, a user would be created. Uh, the listener would make a change and save the user, and all of a sudden the user's name would be the name of the event, and we'd have all these users with uh, a name of notify, something like that. Thankfully, we noticed this in development, and we were able to get around it. Our main solution was we just had a standard event that we'd always use that extended the main of the symphony event and had a payload that you could manage. So we'd push our object or model into that as a payload. We also extended this a little bit further by creating a notion of something that was queuable. So a lot of times, like raising an event that should send an email, we don't want to send the email there and then. It's something that can be queued for later. So we implemented a, an interface called queuable that just said, if an event is raised that is queuable, then it's possible that we might want to stick this in a queue. And then in our listener, get the payload, check to see if it's queuable. And if it is, we had a map of beanstalk tubes, so a new user. We want to tweet that that user's just signed up, get the ID from the payload, and stick it in that tube. Downside to that approach is we had, have to have tubes for each specific task. So we have a tube for sending tweets related to new users, one for tweets related to something else. But it's a nice way of being able to take things away from the, the web execution cycle, at least. Glass magically refilled itself. That's impressive. So we've got PHP and HTML mixed in our code, and we wanted to get rid of that. The solution was Twig. It's not one of the Symphony components, but as I say, it's one of the friends that is <coughs> built by the same people. Set up and load it. Create a new Twig loader from your file system, and you tell it where your templates are going to be stored. So I want Twig to look in the templates folder for any templates. And I'm going to create a Twig environment, which is effectively your Twig instance, and pass the loader to it. Then say I want to load this template, so I want it to get the index.twig file from my templates folder, and I want to render it, and I pass an array of any, any sort of replacements I want it to do when it's generating the, the output. So in order for us to quickly refactor to allow Twig within our application, we created an abstract view. Simply had a constructor, which took the container, created the uh, template engine, had an abstract method called generate, where the uh, when the view was created, the controller would pass the model to it, and then a render method, which would take the name of the template file. So when generate was called, it was that method's job to say, I want now to render this template. Uh, this is the template name in question. And it would also take any information from the model and set it up as template variables. So we then get template variables from the container, pass them to Twig, render it, and output. An issue with um, Twig and storing the template variables in Pimple is that once you put something in Pimple that's a, a property, so you've got an array in there, you then can't make any changes to it. Once it's there, it's, it's stuck. But if it's an object, you can do what you want to it. So it leaves you with a couple of options, really. You can use an object that converts its data to an array when it's finished, or just directly talk to Twig using the add global method. Uh, it's not a very nice one to, to use. I think anything that's got the word global in normally sounds like a, a bad choice. A brief overview of some of the Twig template uh, syntax. If you've got a variable, just put uh, curly brackets either side, and it will then look in that replacements array that you've provided, find something with that key, and output it. If you want to put a comment in your Twig template, just put curly brace and a hash. You can also set things. So if you did want to put a bit of sneaky, nasty logic in, you could say, I want to create a new variable, and from that I want to get an object that I pass to Twig, and I want to call this method. You can loop through things quite nicely, so for every item in a list of items, I want to display something in a list. There I'm getting the index of the loop, so it's item number one, item number two, and then the item name. 
otherwise if it's empty, display something else. So it's got very nice, easy to use syntax. It's based heavily around the sort of Django syntax. And you can even extend it to use whatever, uh, whatever syntax you want. If you want it to look like a different templating engine, you can do that quite easily. It's also got support built in for caching your compiled templates. This isn't your actual output. This is just the Twig templates themselves, turning them into executable logic. <coughs> you just pass a parameter with your cache folder in. One thing that is unfortunate is this isn't consistent with the likes of the router, where it was cache underscore dir. This one's just called cache. Pass it a, a path to a folder, and it will put some template caching in there. If you want to introduce any output caching into your templates, uh, we'll recommend using this uh, it's the Desarola 2 library. There's a guy that went and made a, a very simple caching library that's available via packages. So you can just add it to your composer JSON file, download it, and make use of it. Uh, you just tell it where you want to store your cache. So in this case, we're storing it in a file. Pass an option that says there's a time to live on this particular, uh, any particular things I'm putting into it. And that's something we're getting from the container. And we also tell it where the cache is going to be stored. Then when we generate, uh, when a request comes in, we take the URL, MD5 it, so we've got a cache key, and then we look to see if the cache is enabled. We've added something to our roots file that says this page can be cached, so we've got this cacheable property. If it's enabled and this particular page is cacheable, and the user isn't logged in, and the cache exists, then get the cache, print it out. It also means you've got to make a change to when you're generating your templates to actually store a cache, but it's very straightforward so you can get up and running with you know, five or six lines of code there, which is very nice. We also introduced validation. I'm not going to go into this too much because uh, there's not very much time left. Uh, the one that we went for was actually the Fuel validator from the Fuel PHP framework. At the time, we just found there's a lot more documentation available and it's much easier to get started with. But both the Fuel validator and the Symphony validator have a hell of a lot of information there, a lot of predefined um, criteria, so you could say I want to validate that this is an email address, and they're both very nice frameworks for being able to chain a number of rules together and get back an array of issues that are, are there with some form submissions, so it's worth looking into them as well. We had a lot of things that were directly looking at the, the cookies array or the session array, post and get data, which wasn't very nice, we wanted to try and abstract that out, so we made use of the HTTP Foundation component basically abstracts out all of your super globals and for the HTTP request and also the HTTP response. In terms of the request, just create a request and then statically create it from globals. And it then has a number of properties. So it's got a request property, which has got your post data, query property, it's got your get data, and so on. Uh, these properties are actually what Symfony call a parameter bag. So they've got a lot of methods that are implemented such as you can call all on it, and it will give you all of the properties. You could say, just give me the keys, just get a specific one, add a specific one, set something, does something exist, and remove something. So it's quite a, a nice way of being able to access a, an array. You want to send a response to the user, so perhaps you've got an API aspect to your application, or you just want to correctly set some headers. Just create a response, set some content, set your status code, and set the content type, and then send the response to the browser. Uh, alternatively, you can bundle all these in one line. And you can just say a new response with some content, status code, content type. Translation, it's worth a mention. It's at least one or two talks in itself. And the component allows you to provide a dictionary of words uh, and also a dictionary of, sort of things that appear in your template. So if you've got hello and then a user's name, you can actually put that somewhere in your in your a language file and say, if this occurs, I want to look in my dictionary of words and pull out the hello, but leave the user's name as it is. Uh, it doesn't provide anything to actually do the translation. It just provides a framework for you to provide the translations already. Great support for the, with the likes of Twig. Uh, so it's very easy to, to use from that, that perspective, but it's too much to go into at this stage. All of the emailing that we had was just using the PHP mail function which meant, again, we're in a situation where we couldn't test what we had, we couldn't inject a new mail object, and the logic for that was throughout the code. So we made use of Swift Mailer. Uh, really easy to get up and running with, create a new instance. So we had something in our pimple container that we could say, give me a new, new email instance, and it would create one of these. 
we then, from our container, get the host, get the username, get the password. We make use of the likes of uh, Postmark app and Mailgun for sending transactional emails. So it's nice to be able to quickly inject those as well. Create a message, so I've just got who's it from, email address and a name, who's it to, email address and a name, and then some content. Send it, create a new mailer, passing the transport engine that we already created earlier, so passing this, and then send, and we've sent our email. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, a lot. <laughs> To, to move for, for the old legacy go to the new component system? The project itself lasted about four months, but the, the way that we did it, we did it in very small stages, and we often went over old ground again and again. So the first stage, I said, was to sort of move to the, the PSRO standard. When we did that, we then had to sort of go back over that to introduce Pimple and then go back over it again. We did it, we did it particularly over a long period of time so that we could do it carefully. How many hours? Oh. I don't, don't even want to think of it. There was uh, myself and two other developers working full-time on that project as well as a designer uh, for most of those, those four months plus over time and that kind of thing. So I don't want to even think about the man hours involved. But it was a hell of a lot quicker than if we'd used the likes of an existing framework or off-the-shelf solution because when we planned that out, we would have needed a lot more. We just, there was so much work involved in working out all the business logic that was already there and taking that out. Whereas we didn't need to worry about that, we just improved on what was already there. Yeah. Um, right. Because um, you said that you've like taken away the business logic from the application layer and just replaced the application layer itself. <coughs> yeah. Is my assumption right that you've been lucky not to have the business logic mixed up within the application layer all over the place? Uh, no, we did originally have that both of them intertwined, but as we were removing the sort of application logic, we were able to then say, right, there's the business logic that remains, let's refactor that as well. So on top of the refactoring to the components, we did have to refactor all of the business logic that was there, but we didn't have to worry about porting it to another system, so there wasn't as much, as much risk to losing it. But you were still running the risk that you could actually mess up something with the business logic. That, that sounds like a complete rewrite of the system, really. <laughs> um, obviously, depending how much business logic you could find, like in templates, yeah. which happens a lot of time, or in your controllers, or in you know, all sort of random places uh, throughout the system. Yeah, um, it, when we had the end result, it was effectively almost a rewrite, but we did it in small stages. So the first stage was, let's just refactor it so that it's PSRO, let's refactor it so dependencies are injected. And then at the end, we did have effectively a, a new product, but that retained a lot of the previous business logic. So out of interest, um, the end result, how roughly many problems you had around the business logic? <laughs> Uh, in most cases, uh, everything's been fine. The main thing where we had some issues with business logic was actually because the business logic changed during the refactoring. So we had some bits of the old stuff, some bits of the new stuff, and some things where we just hadn't got the requirements quite nailed. Um, we've been very fortunate, um, but we have had to make quite a lot of changes since the new launch of the new application just because of the business changing. So I think we've, been, we've probably been luckier than the most would have been on that regard. All right, thanks. thanks. Hi. Here. Hi. Uh, Hi. When you pass around a dependency container to lots of objects, yeah. um, has it got any performance problem or any kind of uh, memory issues or anything? Or it Not noticed anything with regards to the, uh, the container. Um, though the way that we've, we've done it is we have built a number of containers that sometimes reference each other. So as I mentioned with the sort of factory container, that isn't actually instantiated until you first say to the primary container, give me the factory container. So the making use of the lazy loading has really helped in that regard and also separating it into a, a number of interlinked containers. Uh, but we've not noticed any issues with regards to memory and performance. The main one was to do with YAML file and YAML file parsing. With the, the routing, I actually by mistake when I was putting the routing in place had uh, 
one line of code duplicated somewhere else that wasn't required. And when I removed it, I had a 40% improvement on the CPU performance. So um, it's not a big fan of the performance that YAML has, but it's a nice, nice thing to use. Thank you. Yeah. Um, your uh, legacy app was uh, native PHP. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering how uh, the Symfony components would slot into a legacy PHP app that was built in another framework. I think they're quite easy to use one at a time. So you'd have to take that sort of approach and say, right, I want to, I want to make use of this particular component to improve this aspect. Where you'll probably fall down is where that the existing framework or content management system already has built-in support for the likes of, say, routing. You're probably going to find that's going to be a difficult thing because it's very tightly coupled with the, the framework of choice. Whereas if it's something where you're just making use of an aspect of the framework, you could say, actually, I'll just not use that bit of the framework and use the Symfony component instead. Cool. Thanks. I have another more question. Yeah. Have you assessed the size of the project before and after? Or can you tell me how big the project was, like in terms of lines of code or, or, or something like this? I, unfortunately, I can't. I don't have any of those sort of uh, metrics to hand. But it was, it did take longer than we initially expected. But it was still nowhere near as long as we'd estimated if we were to use an, another system. The main reason for it taking a bit longer was there were lots of changes in sort of some of the new business logic that we needed to add in, and just the the learning curve of all of the team because. Some of the components were new to the members of the team, so they needed to, to learn about those as well. But Will you be able to compare it to any of the open source project in terms of the size? Um, trying to think. It probably sort of on a similar sort of scale to <coughs> maybe a, a trimmed down version of WordPress or something like that in terms of, sort of the number of files and methods and that kind of thing. Just just a, a pluck in, pluck in the air, I guess, there, really. OK, thanks. Hi, yeah. Um, were you having to uh, develop new features for the application at the same time as refactoring, or did you get a block of time just to concentrate on refactoring the app? We did have some new features that had to be added, but they came later. So before we released, we did the refactoring. Uh, each sort of little stage, refactor this, refactor that. Then it was a case of, right, let's focus on the new business logic. There was one or two exceptions where the new business logic dictated that we were literally ripping one existing feature apart, in which case we thought there's no point in refactoring that and then adding the new feature. But there was a lot that we did just keep along as we're going. Okay, thanks. Yeah? How did you manage the, de the deployment of the... Are you talking about the rolling out the, the new yeah. application? Uh, what we did was we took the existing site uh, over a weekend and on a Sunday, and it was a Sunday night, just got back from a PHP Northwest conference, me and the rest of the team, so we're really tired. We all assembled online. We disabled logins so that the site was still available, still functioning, but a user couldn't log in, so there's no new content. We put a notification on that said, um, you know, you can't make use of the site. We created database patches every time we were making a small change to the database that we sort of ran during development. And we tested this, obviously, before we, we did the deployment. But a new server, which was uh, just made it a lot easier as well for the new site. So we set up a new server, put the code on there, imported the database at one particular moment in time once logins were disabled, so we knew there was no new content. Uh, and we ran our database mig migrations. That was just a case of updating the DNS and waiting for that to propagate. So we did have a couple of hours where people couldn't contribute to the site, but it was done overnight, so there wasn't too much of an issue. Yeah. Uh, did you write a uh, test and functional test before jumping into refactoring? We added uh, a small number of unit tests. We didn't really add any sort of any more complicated tests than that, but we didn't have very many. The application had none to start with. Uh, we looked at adding as many as we could during the sort of refactoring process, but unfortunately we were left with not enough time to do as good a job as I want. And that's a pretty bad excuse for lack of unit tests, but there it is. If you've not used that excuse for not running unit tests, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Anyone else? I'll ask one myself. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I can imagine dropping in a single component to replace one piece of functionality is quite straightforward. But when you have something that's a bit more ubiquitous, like the router itself, was there particular challenges or any particular component that was quite hard to do all at once? The, the one that was most difficult was, uh, the, well, the two, I suppose, the introducing the class loader, because that required us to pretty much update all of the code to a new standard and to a new structure in, in one go before we could really get that fully in integrated, but the most difficult one was probably Twig. We initially went for a, a shorter approach where we used a different templating engine and halfway through the project we thought this isn't really going to give us the flexibility we want, so we decided to use Twig and that, that was a big job. Anyone else? Yeah. Is that someone at the back or no? All right, thank you very much.